I talked about this on Saturday, and I thought I'd bring it up again, just depending on the background you're in. Uh, uh, before I get into that, I want to say that um, uh, we all come from different backgrounds, Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, whatever. And you will hear me from time to time put down a particular doctrine of a particular dom denomination. And that is never meant to pick on people. That is meant to pick on whatever issue I believe is at fault. On the opposite end of that spectrum comes people that say that everybody else is wrong except our denomination. And that almost defines a cult. The Jehovah's Witnesses will do that. The Mormons will do that. And to some extent, the Catholics say you can't be saved outside of the Catholic Church. So it's good to know that there's a difference between calling bad doctrine, which the Lord expects us to do, and naming people, because there are good people in Catholic churches, there are good people in Presbyterian and Methodist and Episcopal and all the other churches that have things that I believe divert from the Bible. Um, so I wanted to bring up that point before I talk about what we talked about for just a minute on Saturday night is this is what I believe is that this book is divinely inspired by God okay and I think that probably all of you agree with that if you don't we can talk about it individually and I can show you why I believe that but it, the claim is made within it itself uh, for prophecy never came about by the will of man but holy men of God were carried along as moved by the Holy Spirit of God and um, uh, what's the other one that says uh, all scripture is inspired by God is God breathed and is useful profitable for training instruction correcting and righteousness so that the man of God will be uh, a little misquote at the end there but anyway so the Bible makes the claim that it is the Holy Spirit that breathed through people in order to give us this book and I was listening to what's called the um, Great Awakening on Channel 22. Now, I don't know if anybody watches Channel 22. They got so much nonsense on there. These guys that say, send us money and you're going to be blessed. Send us money and you're going to be blessed. And one of the guys, Rod Parsley, a couple days ago said, he's talking to people that are financially in debt, some of them completely in debt. And he says, we know the trouble you're having and we have the answer to your debt problem. He said, if you sow a seed in faith to this ministry, God will release his power of taking care of your debt. And he started going $100, $50, $100. But if you want to see the great release, send in $1,000. And I thought, these people are criminals, right? So, I, you know, I, I, what I do is I just click. I'm watching something on TV, you know, and I don't watch a lot of TV. All I got is like 12 channels. I got the basic, and it's only because it's cheaper to have that than it is to have internet only. So I'll watch like... PBS when they have a thing about animals or whatever. But while it's on, if there's any commercial, I click to 22 just to see what people are talking about. And I get myself really angry. Oral Roberts Ministry. Yeah, oh, it, yeah it's a commercial about sending us money. Oh. But anyway, I, so I'm sitting here and I, I, I listen for one or two minutes and I go back to whatever I was watching. And uh, this Great Awakening started in January, and they have different pastors come on, different uh, church, uh, uh, people in a church up in Tampa, which is where CTN is located. And they, they're talking about this great harvest that they're bringing about by the Great Awakening. That's why it's called the Great Awakening. And I heard about two weeks ago them say, well, we've had 3,226 conversions to Jesus, we've had 18,222 miracle healings, and then they said, and we've had 7,000 baptisms of the Holy Spirit. And I was like, you know, so we talked about that maybe in this class a week or two ago, but I had no idea what they were talking about, baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then last week, the guy repeated it. We're up to 8,227 baptisms of the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in tongues. And I go, oh. That answers it. So here's the whole point of what I'm getting at. Is this inspired by God? Is this God's word to us? Okay, if this is God's word to us, then anything that is in here cannot be contradicted by something that's happening in a church and you still claim that it's the Holy Spirit that's doing it. Do you understand the logic? Okay, so the Bible says that if you were to speak in tongues, you are not to do it without a translator. Secondly, you're not to do it more than three people in a congregation, and there must be a translator present. So you have, uh, uh, you have to speak in tongues, no, no more than three people, and it must be translated. And there's one more point that I'm forgetting. Anyway, 
They don't do that in charismatic churches. People just speak in tongues all the time, and there's dozens of them. They're going all over the place. Oral Roberts, when he's preaching, starts going, shabba laba dooba dooba, you know, and he's not Oral Roberts, his son Richard. And that cannot be of the Holy Spirit. So I just, I don't know what your background is, if you come from a, a charismatic background, but it's either one or the other. Either the Bible is correct, or what they're doing is correct. And if they're, what they're doing is correct, then that means this isn't correct. It's one or the other. And the Bible says that you cannot do this and expect it to be spirit-led. So I just want you to keep that in mind and think about it. And if you have any issue with speaking in tongues, I can take you to the passage. There's 1 Corinthians, I believe, 14, and we can talk about it. We can go through what the Bible says. But to stand up in a church and make a bunch of nonsensical noises is not being filled with the Holy Spirit in any way, shape, or form. It, it, it has nothing to do with it. And in fact, any time that the term tongues is used in the Bible, it means languages. That's evidenced by Acts 2 in particular, where there were people from 70 nations, and he names them Parthians and Medes and Persians and Medanites and all these different people. And they all heard God speaking to them in the same language, in their, in their own ears. And so these are known languages that are being translated by, you know, like a Star Trek universal translator or something. Everybody understood them, even though they didn't know what they were originally speaking. Somehow there's this translator going on from the Holy Spirit to the ears of the people. And vice versa. When Peter was speaking, he was certainly speaking in his language, but it was transferred to the people. So I just wanted to get that out because when I heard this on TV, I don't know who here does and doesn't click through and watch these people, but you know, it's almost scary because they make it sound like if you're not speaking in tongues, you're doing something wrong. And I've, uh, when I was looking for a college to attend, three of, I believe, three of the colleges here in Florida required that you spoke in tongues before you were considered a Christian and could be admitted to their college. It was mandatory. So all you had to do was go stand up in the congregation and go, blah, 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 and that was it. That's all they needed. And that, to me, is insane. So please keep that in mind. Don't mean to degrade anybody ever when I'm talking about doctrine, but doctrine is doctrine, and either the Bible is true or it's not. So if I get down on the Episcopals for having homosexual uh, uh, bishops, it's because the Bible does not allow that. So please don't take offense at the denomination that you came from. That's not who I'm picking on, it's the people. I'm picking on what they are doing, which violates this. Okay? I love God's word because this is all I have of Jesus until he comes. So I, oh, there we go. Okay, anyway, if uh, new program on TV that comes on Wednesday night, Beyond Belief. No. Last, last week, I think it comes on about 9 or 10 every Wednesday night. Last week was the first one. But it had uh, uh, people who were watching the statues of Mary. Oh, no. That is Beyond Belief crying and bleeding. And yeah, they were crying, and that one woman said, oh. oh, my goodness, I see it for myself. I showed the statue and I didn't see anything and I kept sitting up thinking, well, what in the world is she seeing? Yeah. You know? Self induced I uh about she was crying and so I'm anxious to see what Wednesday night's gonna be. Oh boy. Beyond belief is the name of it. Wow. Wow. I might not watch it anymore. Yeah, oh yeah. It, there, there's a point where you have to say, I've seen enough, and it's like me with the Christian TV. I just, I, it's the imp of the perverse in me to say, boop, and then just want to hear. Here's what I do with, especially with Richard Roberts, Oral Roberts' son. I do it every time I click onto it. I start counting. One, Second. two. That's right. And it's usually within eight to ten seconds they're asking for money. Almost always. Or what they're talking about indirectly is leading them to the point where they're asking for money. And it's usually within ten seconds. Never more than a minute. Ever. And I think this is their whole life is based on money and prosperity, and it's so sad. So we're going to start with uh, chapter 37 today after we say a quick prayer. Oh, glorious Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together, and thank you for the wonderful rain we got yesterday. Thank you for this church 
and how we come to meet together and we can search your word and we can do it in freedom and we can do it with joy. Thank you for that wonderful music yesterday. It was just absolutely touching to hear the, the songs about Jesus one after another after another. It was glorious. Lord, we thank you for all the goodness you display in our lives and please open your word to us today so that we can see wondrous things in it. And may your glorious name ever be praised. Amen. All right, so... Anybody gets to chapter 37, just start reading. I'll stop you whenever something... Uh, what's, oh, well, I did because I just did the video. Normally, I do the video like Tuesday or Wednesday. I was so sick this week, I didn't get it until a day ago, so I remembered where it was. But uh, <coughs> what's that? He's a crutch. Crutch? Finding his oh, he really is. Uh, Gene uh, Grant, he's got um, Diane's uh, husband. He's got one of those computer things that automatically highlights where he's at. He goes verse by verse. So if we don't have him, usually we have no idea, and it takes us a few minutes to get figure out where, where we were. But I know we're in 37.1, so please, start reading anybody. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. What did your 37 one say again? Jacob dwelt? In the land where his father had stayed. Okay, this one says where his father was a stranger. And anybody have something different? She says sojourned. Yeah. Sojourned. sojourned. Okay, sojourned. All right, that's a better word, and I know that's the context. Here they said stranger, there they said sojourned. But where he stayed doesn't give you the emphasis of what we need. And Well, temporary. And the reason why goes back to what we talked about way back in Genesis 15, where the promise was made to Abraham, and then he goes, um, in verse 13, he says, Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. Okay, so that was a promise that it would be 400, and it was 430 years based on um, Galatians chapter 3. From the time of Abraham to the time of of the covenant being received, or actually from the time they departed from Egypt. It was a 430 year time frame. They were not in Egypt 400 years, and we talked about that on Saturday night. They were in Egypt for about 215 years, about that time frame, and you can do that based on the ages, but people look at the way it's termed and they say, well, oh, it was 400 years in Egypt because of what it says in uh, Exodus 13, somewhere where it says the time that the Israelites dwelt in Egypt or sojourned in Egypt was 430 years, which is not a correct translation. The translation, uh, uh, there, there's two ancient witnesses, the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint, which say dwelt in Egypt and in Canaan. And also, the way the King James Version puts parentheses within the sentence offsets dwelt in the land of Egypt, saying that it was a portion of the time they were in Egypt, not the whole time. And I don't mean to get confusing here, but if you take the years of the people's lives, Isaac, a Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, and then um, uh, Joseph and Levi, they give the ages of these people, and you figure it out, and I've got it on my website if you ever want to read it, it was about 200 years that they were actually in Egypt. That means that the promise was either a lie in Genesis 15 or we have misread it. And the promise in Genesis 15 says that they will be strangers in a land not theirs. It doesn't say in Egypt. And so this is including the time in Canaan, which this verse here confirms that Abraham was a stranger. We're going to read the same thing about Isaac. Isaac was a stranger in the land. They dwelt there, but they were not owners. They were pilgrims in the land. But if you go to 15, 16, don't go there. I'll just read it to you. It says, um, but in the fourth generation, they will return here. Okay. And that was speaking specifically of the time in Egypt, not the time in Canaan and Egypt. And if you count the number of generations that went down to Egypt, Isaac was an old man. He went down there. There he died. And then you have his son, which would be, um, uh, I'm sorry, Israel went down there. His son, Levi, his son a Abraham, and his son Moses. And after that, after those four generations, their children came out of the land of Egypt. And so there were four generations in Egypt, but 
there were only about 215 years in Egypt. And the reason why I bring that up is because some people believe that there is like this contradiction in the Bible, and there's not. Paul is very clear about it in the book of Galatians. It's 430 years from the time of the promise to Abraham in Genesis 15 to the time of the exodus from Egypt, which is in uh, Exodus 13, 430 years. Anyway, actually, it's, yes? This, uh, this father had lived as a foreigner. Uh, we're all foreigners, aren't we? We are, and we're, that's confirmed in the New Testament about us. That's exactly right. It says that we are pilgrims and strangers in this land. 